Okay, so welcome. Welcome to this month's CC Group uh, webinar. Um, let me jump straight in. A few more people are still joining the webinar, but what I want to do is just say something about the topic and introduce our speakers. So we have three speakers uh, with us today. Katie DeCosa is Head of Enterprise Technology uh, here at CC Group PR. She's led um, UK communications programs, EMEA-wide and global programs for some amazing companies. My name is Duncan Chappell. I'm Head of Analyst Relations here. And we're joined by David Hopp. David also has an amazing background through, through Fuse, uh, SAP Concur, before then Tableau, uh, Steelcase as well. And of course, the, the most important participants here are, are you. Yeah? So you, your questions, your online feedback are, are really welcome and important. So today we're going to be discussing analysts, analysts and, and the future of work, the way that work is changing, the way that analysts are changing alongside that. And of course, this is something where you're going to have opinions. So I want to invite David to uh, jump straight in. Uh, with a little icebreaker that sh that uh, that we're going to uh, share now, and please keep an eye on the on the chat panel here. David is going to pop in a link, and you can even see the Bitly link here if you if you prefer to manually type it in. David, let me hand over to you. Thank you so much, Duncan. It's a pleasure to be in front of you all. And um, I know we all really appreciate um, your participation in this. Um, but right now, I want to hear from you right now around the good, the bad, and the ugly in the AR space, um, especially during these times. So in a moment, I'll be sharing um, a link for you to click on. And I will also be sharing my screen. So this is a tool that I like to use um, called Slido. Um, it just asks some questions and um, polls uh, the audience. So once you um, have clicked on that link or you can join uh, via a QR code on a mobile device, um, but let's start off with the first question. Um, so you should again have been directed to a browser. Um, I'm going to unlock. So the first question is what have been some AR pain points? Um, since the pandemic, and you can type in um, your responses um, if you'd like, and you can also enter multiple um, responses. So I see one, tight schedules, yes, exactly, and I'll be talking about that a little bit more later. High demand for briefings, yes, not just for us, but yes, for them. Zoom fatigue, of course, analysts seem really busy. Yes, they do, and if you see an answer pop up, you can enter um, that same answer. And the point of this is to kind of overlap a bit, but I'll give it a minute. Board spokespeople, that disappeared. Gartner availability, yes. Proving business impact. I'll give it about 15 more seconds. Yes, Zoom fatigue. All right, perfect. I'm gonna go ahead and close out the poll. And on to the next one, the next question. What have been some positive outcomes in your AR world since the pandemic? It could be spending more time with family at home, which impacts, in my opinion, our performance. Although, fun fact about me, I spent the last four months in Michigan living with my parents um, after being in New York City, so before the pandemic. And nobody over the age of 30 should have to live with their parents. So, but it brought us closer. Increased productivity, yeah. More interest in AR, more video, less phone. Colleagues are humanized. Opportunity to reconnect, yes. I love the more interest in AR and I'll be speaking to that as well in a little bit. We have about 30 more seconds. I think we had nine people respond in the last one. Kids, cats. <laughs> with all this work from home, I'm seriously considering getting a puppy. More honesty, yeah, authenticity. No travel. All right, a couple more seconds before I close out this poll. None, work from home always. <laughs> 
All right. I'm loving these answers and we'll share these answers after the webinar. So I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. Thank you so much for participating. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I will hand it back to you, Duncan. Good. So um, Katie, I'm gonna hand over, over to you and just let me know when you want me to press the up button and the down button. Just before you do that, I should say, I see some questions coming in on the Q and A. Uh, but they are mostly about how do you type in the box. I hope people have worked have, have have worked that out. If not, then maybe it was some maybe there's some some problem uh, that we've uh, that we that, that people had with Slido. But um, but at least there's no more. Well, th th this is the it's the only time you have to engage with Slido maybe in your life. Katie, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Duncan. That's great. And yeah, just to say, we'll keep a, a really close eye on the questions that are coming through in the chat box and do our very best to respond to them and, and any follow ups that are needed afterwards. So, yeah, if we could move on to the next slide, Duncan, that'd be fab. Um, it kind of felt right to open up this session by drilling into what we mean by future of work and, and what other way to do that than with a quote from Gartner that kind of succinctly describes the topic, topic that we're talking about today. Um, so the future of work is about forging a new relationship between technology and talent that transforms existing ways of working and doing business. Um, and I think, you know, what feels important about this particular quote is this linking of technology and talent because, you know, one cannot exist independently um, of the other. So if we could move on to the next slide, Duncan. Um, and if we think about the past 10 years, you know, it feels like we've seen more and more businesses embrace digital transformation. And that's largely been kind of in response to like staff, customer and market demands. And especially where the goals of like, business and IT interconnect, there's been a big focus on technologies that enable more productive working lives and spaces. Um, we started to use uh, the term modern workplace. We started to talk about workers what you do rather than the place that you go um, but that transformation into a modern work workplace has always required more than technology for sure so you know cultures that are founded on collaboration and openness are, are hugely important and of course relationships that are, are rooted in trust as well um, you know flexible working which sort of five to ten years ago may have been seen as a perk are not seen that way anymore. They are a really key consideration for prospective talent when they're picking out their next roles. And they're a really important driver um, behind employee motivation, productivity, and, and staff retention as well. That's not just millennials. I think we all remember those times when it was millennials that kind of drove the data behind those surveys, but it's, it's about all generations becoming much more aware of health and well-being and prioritizing them. So what does this mean for businesses? It meant that, you know, we've had to evolve into a flexible environment that enables continued unifying communications and collaboration. If we could move on to the next slide, Duncan. And then we can sort of think, well, how has the market responded to this? Um, well, it's been a move away from traditional PBX to cloud. Um, and we've seen the emergence of some cloud first UCAS players, so the likes of Fuse, 8x8, Ring Central. Um, and what's really kind of interesting to look at as well is how the analyst community have responded to this evolution. Uh, you, you may all remember that about 18 months ago, I think it was February 2019, there was kind of a big change that took place in the analyst community. Uh, which felt very much like a response from that enterprise move from PBX to the cloud when Gartner ditched its unified comms uh, magic quadrant in replacement of UCAS. Um, and as part of that move, what Gartner said was that it would only evaluate full, fat, full stack um, software as a service solution providers where the application stack was developed, updated and managed and controlled by the vendor. Um, and I think while it's fair to say that Gartner MQs are not universally loved, they do carry lots of weight in the industry. So it felt like a really big signal. Um, Gartner's got a really prominent voice and the fact that it was actively recognising that enterprises are, are buying differently demonstrated kind of a real major shift away from legacy, legacy infrastructure. 
Um, you know, we noted at the time, I think the Gartner said that by 2023, 40% of um, new enterprise telephony purchases would be made on a cloud office suite. So the likes of Google G Suite or, or Microsoft Office 365. Um, so yeah, this, this all felt, and we can look at the forest to wave five lessons there, which kind of major at the top around integration and, and global um, capabilities, all kind of signals towards this evolving and fluid nature of the UCAS environment. Then if we move on to the next slide, Duncan. Um, yeah, and we fast forward to March 2020, which I think it's fair to say feels like the month that the world turned upside down. So, you know, even those businesses that were reluctant to offer working from home capabilities, whether for cultural or technological reasons, they were suddenly forced to doing it. So, you know, these are changes that are set to be long lasting. I think we're all feeling that at the moment. Um, and as, as people plot those returns to the office, it feels like people are having real dare to dream moments. Um, you know, perhaps we can start to design um, offices as the place that we choose to go rather than have to go. Um, I don't know if you saw this one, but quite a recent Gartner survey showed that um, post COVID-19, three quarters of businesses intend to shift at least some of their employees to work remote work permanently. Um, there's definitely an up, upward trend here, and we saw Twitter announce that it was planning on doing that, um, you know, across the business. Um, but many um, employees kind of according to this hybrid model as well. So, you know, the next normal is, is very much here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to kind of set the scene, really, in terms of the future of work and what it looks like before we dig into the analyst, lands the analyst relations landscape, which, Duncan, I'll pass over to you to do. Thank you so much, Katie. So what I want to do in this section is just spotlight um, analysts' influence, and in particular to talk about some data that we have from, from our partners at the University of Edinburgh who have been able to spotlight to us the analyst firms who are, who are most influential in the, uh, in the enterprise. So here are, some, here are some slides that they've helpfully uh, built, uh, built for me. Uh, but people may know that the Analyst Firm Awards have been conducted for, for I don't know, six, seven, eight, eight years now. And, and every year, what they're trying to do is look at which analyst firms are most valuable for, for end users who are, who are trying to use Analyst Insight to change uh, the way that their organizations are, are using technologies and leveraging them. So the research is, is sponsored uh, by by us here here at CC Group, but we're, we're extremely lucky that the, the 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 bill is actually being picked up by the Economic and, and Social Research Council, which is the UK uh, uh, government research council that is responsible for research into 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 the social sciences. They are supporting the Analyst Value Survey, which the Analyst Observatory conducts every year at the University of Edinburgh Business School. And they are reaching out to people both on the enterprise side, both on the, on the, on the demand side, I suppose, as well as people on the supply side. And they're asking them which topics they're using analysts for, which are the most valuable services that analysts produce, and which firms are the most valuable for uh, for each uh, of the uh, of the of the services what comes out of that uh, unsurprisingly is is uh, a really complex uh, um, picture that when they ask the the customers of analyst firms and the users of analyst firms why they are using analysts we get a really detailed picture i used to be an analyst 20 years ago something like that back in the dot com boom and back then it used to be that customers had very little uh, impact, uh, sorry, had the, customers had very little interaction with us and that our impact was really limited to, uh, to research, very occasionally to, uh, to, uh, to consulting uh, projects. But what we see now is this huge range, this extremely varied um, buffet of ways in which analyst firms are distributing research towards, um, uh, towards end users. 
and they uh, their data at the university is is consolidated together in in the in the analyst firm awards. You can read a bit more about it on the on the analyst observatory website at the, and and on analystsurvey.com. But what, what I'm going to show to you now is a is a global slice of data from uh, from the uh, from the from the study. So that means looking across all of the coverage areas that are used by people in the uh, in the enterprise. And what their analysis does is it basically looks at which analyst firms are each, uh, each participant in the survey using, and then how valuable do they say those firms are, and then for what kinds of activities are they, are they using them, and then, they're, and then they're totaled up in this way. And there are basically three groups of analyst firms. Firstly, there are the platinum firms. So these are the firms added together they represent most of the value that are being generated by analyst firms for the enterprise. And then the second layer are the gold firms. So when you add the platinum firms and the gold firms together, you've got more than two thirds of all of the value being created uh, for the enterprise by, by the analyst industry. And of course, that leaves you with uh, a, a little bit less than one third. All of the other firms added together have got one third of uh, of that influence. As I mentioned, it's a it's an annual study, and uh, I must admit, there's actually not as much change as you might imagine uh, from from year to year. It's a kind of precondition of awards that there have to be changes, but really there aren't that many. Uh, but what they found uh, in the 2019 study was that uh, there, were, there were a couple of firms that, that rose up notably. So 451, uh, which obviously now has been bought by S&P, Standard and, and Poor's, has, has, uh, had risen. And Everest uh, also had risen. Uh, but actually, um, m most of these organizations have performed very well in previous, uh, in previous studies. What I want to just remind you is about the Q&A tab. So we're going to come back to questions and answers at the end. If you're unlucky and the bandwidth holds out, we may even turn on our cameras. Uh, but the uh, uh, but, but, but Q&A tab is open for, for questions and comments. What I'm going to do now is hand over to, uh, uh, to David. And again, what I'm going to do is stop sharing so that so that he can uh, so that he can share his screen we're in Europe, he's in North America. It's just gonna be a little bit easier if he shares his slides. Thank you so much, Duncan. I would rather be in uh, Europe right now, but I'm content um, <laughs> for now being in Chicago. So <laughs> Thank you. Um, allow me to share my screen with you all. And David, just just while you're sharing the screen, I can. Uh, there's just a, uh, a, a something in the in the in the chat that I should respond to. Yeah, what what we'll sure. do is we're going to. People are asking about the slides and can they see the slides later on? So there will be a replay of this slide. You can come in on on exactly the same link that you used to access this webinar. If you give us an an, an hour or two later on, you'll be able to come in and there will be a replay. Uh, available and if you email us of course we'll be able to uh, help you with the slides so David th let me hand back to you thank you Duncan um, and of course to echo uh, what Duncan said please feel free to add any questions or comments um, into the chat or Q&A we're gonna have a section toward the end and if we don't get to them all we're happy to respond uh, via email so what I would love to talk to you all about is uh, the analyst relations world, our world. And to reiterate what Katie said earlier, our world has been turned upside down. So what I'm going to go through uh, with you all is just some of my observations and experiences and things that I've read um, and just kind of consolidated into um, some content that will hopefully resonate with um, all of you, if not most. Um, but yeah, we're in a very special, special time right now. So um, I'd like to start off with just um, sharing a couple observations, like I said, that I've been seeing um, since COVID started. Um, analysts have more and less time. And as we uh, were showed in the um, Slido word cloud, um, they're more bu they're busier. Um, and not only are they um, busier um, just with 
their own clients and other vendor briefings, but um, they're uh, busier writing um, other reports related to COVID. They're um, refreshing market forecasts. So uh, it's kind of a tricky um, situation, but um, they have more and less time. So, you know, they're not traveling. Um, they're spending more time at home, obviously. Um, so it's it's a tricky, a tricky field to navigate through. Um, and the second thing um, that I've noticed is relationship building is shifting. Um, analysts are also leaning more on the vendors for information about um, engagement stats with their product. You know, um, I'm sure a couple vendors have seen large spikes in engagement, um, such as you know Zoom um, and Ring Central, and of course Fuse. Um, the, our relationships with customers are shifting. You know, they are um, have, we're having different conversations, which I'll talk about in a second, but. Um, you have this um, situation where people and companies are not paying their bills on time or they're, they're asking vendors for more discounts. So that relationships um, and relationship building is changing across all accords. And like I mentioned before, um, conversations are changing. So for us AR professionals, um, conversations with analysts and internal teams are changing. There is a lot more uncertainty, so more questions, higher stakes. Another thing, pain point that I caught uh, in the Slido icebreaker is proving business impact. AR is even more or should be more relevant than ever for a business, but it's up to us to continue um, showcasing and sharing the return on investment and how much money we're bringing, we're bringing companies. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about um, is communication. Um, we're shifting communication at such a fast pace. I mean, look at just the big spike in brand awareness with Zoom. You're having celebrities and Instagram memes um, talking about, about Zoom and, and Zoom fatigue was another pain point that was mentioned, right? And so a couple of things that I've noticed um, in addition to the shift is AR professionals have always been on call, right? But I think we're on, on call a lot more than ever. We're always at our computers with a chat function, with um, a video uh, function, and hours are blending um, into non-office hours. I'm sure emails sent at two o'clock in the morning are ever more prevalent um, right now. So what does that mean for us? So the next thing that I would like to talk about is what is next? What is next within um, the AR space for, for us professionals? So I wanted to share just a couple um, things with you. So when I was at Steelcase, I learned a simple marketing flame framework um, while working there. And I'd like to take a stab at applying it to us analyst relations folks. So now near and far is actually not a continuum, but three dimensions that require simultaneous um, and equal attention, excuse me. And as we gain more experience with disruption arising from tribulations, we gain more of a nuanced understanding of the interdependent and sometimes conflicting demands that we're facing within these dimensions. So I'll start with the now. Um, be successful in the now while also making a critical pivot to the far. So the first thing that I think of is surrendering to the changes and uncertainty. The more we lean into them and the more we understand and recognize that they're there, um, the more um, awareness and the more um, success we'll have um, with the negative. Vulnerability is our greatest measure of courage. And so this is the time to be more vulnerable, um, to be more innovative, um, to be um, more creative. Um, so ROI was one of the other pain points that was mentioned. And one thing um, that I'd like to encourage you all to do is enhance those reports. Uh, I used to work at Tableau and um, they're obviously, you know, really famous for, for dashboards. And one of the things that I did was I built an interactive dashboard on Tableau um, and I leveraged our business intelligence team to show exactly you know, how much um, we're getting as far as pipeline and lead gen and even revenue with Magic Quadrant reports, uh, Forrester Wave reports. But now is, 
is is the time to to enhance those reports and do them more than ever. The next part of the framework is the near. Place bets on the future and pivot resources to support those bets. So a couple of things that come to mind for me is plan, plan, plan. Start 2021 planning. Um, look so much more ahead into uh, the future. Try and get ahead of the analysts. Um, upcoming reports and editorial calendars are more important be ever, than ever, and they will change. But this is an opportunity for us to propose new content um, for the analysts. They're listening. So the second thing is leverage um, your company's engagement stats um, if, they, if they've dramatically changed um, and leverage other people uh, around you, such as PR agencies like CC Group, cross-functional teams, uh, like product marketing, um, customer success, um, we're all in this together. And lastly, uh, part of the framework is the FAR. So envision a future state and future role, knowing that any prediction is uncertain and subject to change. So a couple of things, again, that come to mind is um, find your champions, massage those relationships. And this is uh, with internal um, executives and leadership. So gain buy-in for third-party validation and uh, make a case for how important what we're doing is, especially now. The second thing is embrace yourself uh, for many shifts. Reorganizations will happen within um, companies. You know, marketing budgets are being looked at closer than ever. Uh, there, there might be budget cuts, there might be budget increases, but be ready for that. And also be ready for analyst reorganization. Um, for example, within the UCAS faith at IDC, we were talking to some analysts around what it would look like to move it under the future of work or move it somewhere else within digital transformation. So be ahead, like I said before, ahead, ahead of those conversations um, and propose new content to the analysts. They're listening. So. The last thing um, is celebrate the little wins along the way, all the way through the FAR, and they will snowball into a great impact on your organization and recognize um, the others around you. And so with that, I'm gonna end with a quote from one of my favorite authors, um, going back to vulnerability. So vulnerability is not winning or losing. It's having the courage to show up and be seen when we have no control over the outcome Vulnerability is not weakness. It is our greatest measure of courage. And people who wade into discomfort and vulnerability and tell the truth about their stories are the real badasses. And as they are professionals, I firmly believe that we are the real badasses. So with that, I would love to say thank you um, and open it up to Q&A or if Duncan and Katie, you wanted to uh, say anything or around logistics. I know we have about 30 minutes left. So with that, yeah. I love, I love that quote. That's fantastic. I think one, one thing that really struck me, actually, just to chip in there, you were talking about the importance of doing analyst relations in the mix. And um, I just wanted to kind of cite some research that we did last year, which looked at enterprise technology buyers. And I mean, we, we surveyed a whole load of factors around um, kind of influence and, and information and what you know how they were kind of moving through the buying cycle but when we asked them which of the following information sources were, were most helpful in researching a vendor's suitability industry analyst reports came second after long-standing brand awareness and actually ahead of industry and trade media so I think you know you were talking about agencies like ours David and I think that the key thing here is that you know, we absolutely, and that communications professionals need to be doing this across the board, but just putting putting the analysts front and centre in terms of making sure that, you know, we're working really closely with them when it comes to communications influence. That's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. good observation. Cool. Just to kick <laughs> off the Q&A, actually, Ka Caroline's put in a, a, a specific question here. Um, would be keen to know your thinking about running a virtual analyst day later this year and whether whether she should run it as two half days to keep the interest threshold high. Yeah, I'm happy to um, take a stab at that. Um, mm -hmm. At Fuse, yeah, so at Fuse, we just, 
um, did an analyst day um, or event rather, and it was um, spread over two days to half days. And one thing that I would like to encourage anyone considering a virtual analyst event is um, just ask the analyst what has worked for them and what hasn't. They've probably attended about half a dozen um, virtual analyst events already. Um, so um, they are um, the ones that you should be going to this as the source of truth. Um, the two half days did work for us. Um, another uh, thing that I want to add um, as far as, um, you know, the experience, um, because, you know, we, we don't have the nuances of in-person, face-to-face, small talk, meeting over drinks. Um, get creative, you know, contact your events team and ask what they've been doing um, for virtual events. Um, are there uh, whiskey tastings that you can do um, rather than, uh, or, or even leverage Slido um, as an icebreaker or as a polling. Um, survey them prior, use that content to, to share. Um, another idea that we were gonna do was um, have a kind of like a guest um, matching of people's desks, like spokespeople. So instead of, you know, when you look at somebody on a Zoom call or a, a Fuse call, you see behind them, but, you know, they see their desk. So if you take a picture of their desks and try and match it with the spokesperson, that could be, you know, something interactive. But, but try and think outside the box. Again, this is the time to be innovative and, and creative and ask the analysts what worked for them, what didn't. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, having a virtual event is so much different than in person. You know, we're so used to these in-person events, um, you know, going to Gartner and having our own at our conferences. But um, think outside the box, leverage the analysts as your source of truth and um, plan as early as you can. So those are the three things that I have to say. That's great. Just, I mean, just to, just to jump in on that, I, I see a linked question about, you know, the you know about the agenda for these for these events we we we've worked with a few companies on uh, on events of this type and and with one of our clients Encino which is a cloud banking platform uh we had to help them uh transition very quickly from an from an offline plan to an online plan so they they had a a, a fantastic format for an event which had been really successful for them mixing together customers uh, and and analysts, which is something which has you know always worked a, a, extremely well. Fifteen years ago, I used to help IBM's Tivoli unit with a similar event, and you know it worked out a, a, extremely productively uh, to uh, to combine those elements. I think what they found they needed to do was to really combine vision and execution. Uh, to talk a lot about uh, customer pain points, and then to try to make all of that relevant to to times of change, you know, and I, I think what organizations are finding is that, uh, you know, technology was never 100% of the technology transformation that the organizations had to make. So it's very important for them to speak about the power of culture in times of change and to talk about the difference between, you know, previous customers have been going through more evolutionary changes, suddenly COVID-19 meant revolutionary changes had to happen. But I think what, what, what they were doing with, with that was really trying to tweak their story to be relevant to the kinds of problems that, that clients are submitting to analysts at the moment. And so by sitting back and thinking the most about the kinds of problems that that that, that analysts customers have you know how to do remote delivery how to do remote transformation right now uh how okay. to accelerate the delivery of things you know that made a, a, a huge difference to the effectiveness of that uh, of, of that event the other thing that should be said is um they did break it up into smaller into smaller chunks and then also put the category uh, put, put the content into an online portal in something like 10 or 20 different uh, different bite-sized bits so that people can engage and, and replay that content later on. Uh, Duncan, I did see another question um, from somebody about agendas and within these virtual events to go back to that and mixing customers. And so one thing that, you know, without revealing too many of Fuse's secrets, um, one thing that I want to encourage is, as far as the agenda goes, 
Um, don't, don't be afraid to reflect any um, past time in person um, virtual or uh, analyst events that you've had. Um, just be aware of the time though. Um, Another question was, you know, should I spread it across over two half days or one full day? Um, going back to some of the pain points that we're experiencing um, now is is video fatigue. So um, some of the feedback from the analysts was, I don't want to sit in an eight hour long event, um, but two four hour events um, is is great. Um, but another thing that I would like to recommend and encourage is don't just limit it over the two days. You know, the bulk of the content, of course, can, but leverage the next couple of weeks after. Um, I, uh, I think um, with executive panel one-on-ones or customers, you know, you, it's, it's almost impossible to get everybody together um, when we're not all traveling to the same place for one thing, right? So um, I encourage people to, to extend it a little bit more um, after those two um, after the bulk of the event. So anyway. That's so interesting, David. And actually what you just said there kind of resonated with this thought I have around the beginning of lockdown when all of us, so whether that was us, um, journalists, analysts, um, we were all so hungry for video and there was almost a, you know, an absolute, it, it, that's the way we had to communicate so that we feel like we're together. Um, and then, of course, you know, Zoom fatigue sets in and it takes a, a whole load more energy to, to attend those calls and read the nonverbal cues. And since then, you know, we've had many journalists say, please don't put a Zoom call in my diary. I just want to do this over the phone. Um, and you mentioned, you know, those sort of bite sized events. And one of the things I think that's clear to me is that we will have to keep checking in on this because what's, what feels good now in July 2020 might not in September 2020. And I think we're probably going to all change and evolve and the appetite for certain events or activities might increase and decrease as, you know, as this kind of post-COVID-19 world evolves. Katie, I think that's a really perceptive point. I, I, th I think we see things changing, uh, changing, uh, but also changing quite unevenly. You know, in, in some parts of the world, uh, you know, we're still under lockdown, uh, or, the lo or, or, or we or we have a second wave. In other parts of the world, people are, you know, going back to the office and, and are living their their local lives. So I think yeah. analysts have 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 really different uh, challenges. And, and I think that means that everyone is seeing the need to flex, uh, the need to be much more considerate uh, to the way in which mm -hmm. we're, we're working. And I think a, a, a relentless challenge for analyst relations people is to stop being self-oriented and to start being responsive and relevant to analysts' concerns. And I, th I think this is a great opportunity. In a way, uh, so many organizations are, are kind of atomized and, and, and spread out through, you know, living rooms and dining rooms and, and bedrooms uh, around the world. And actually, one of the good things about that is that groupthink is being under, undermined in organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm seeing clients being much more responsive, much more humane, much more tolerant in the way uh, that, we're, uh, that we're working. You know, and, and actually the, the question about, you know, timing for events is, is a great example of that. Because a few years ago, many vendors wouldn't have blinked twice about getting 100 people into an underground ballroom and turning the lights down low and giving them eight hours of PowerPoint. Yeah, and, and that was, people are proud of doing that. And I think now we understand, well, actually, that's a little bit in, in, inhumane. Actually, I think it was a little bit inhumane even if people were on a... Uh, uh, you know, we're in the room, let alone if they're if if they're on Zoom. Absolutely. We just had um, Fernando did say, as an analyst listening in, can I make a suggestion? So that would be really great to hear, Fernando, if you're if you're willing to pass that on. Maybe we should try and pick up on a question while while Fernando's typing. Yeah. Um, David, I, I saw a question about um, how to work across time zones. 
and uh, I mean, I, I think we all have experiences with that, don't we? How 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 do you how do you deal with that? I mean, I suppose partly, you know, how do you deal with that in the context of an analyst event? But then, just how do you how do you deal with that? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I it it really depends on how many people register your, from your uh, for your event and where they're located. And we we had to do a little bit of prioritizing. Um, but um, most of the analysts that were halfway around the globe were a bit more um, willing to join at nine o'clock PM uh, for, for our event. Um, but we gave extra thought around how can we, uh, you know, make that experience a bit more comfortable for them, you know, ordering dinner or, um, you know, giving them um, some, you know, a, an ultimatum as far as, you know, meeting or getting a briefing of a similar more top level accord after. Um, so I think just the best thing to do is communicate a little bit more um, with the analysts that are in regions halfway around the world from you. Um, and if you have to prioritize just a little bit, um, then then do so. But yeah, it's it, that's that's definitely not going to be the easiest thing to navigate. And um, there's no there's no real perfect answer, but um, prioritize. That's great, David. Thank you. And thank you, Fernando, as well. Um, it was really great to get that feedback directly from you. So Fernando said, four hour briefings, sure, but with good breaks in between, please. No back to back sessions. Yeah, I mean, that just feels very sensible um, in light of the fact that it, it's exhausting. Also, please help your clients with presenting analyst centric data, not just rehashing customer focused presentations. I think that's such a key point around, mm -hmm. you know, bespoke material. Um, this shouldn't just be a, okay, what customer, company, product um, presentation can I pull out here? But it's about um, very analyst-centric data, which has been created specifically for a person and their needs. So that was great, Fernando. Thank you. Just to pick up on that, I think something that's so important is, you know, many organizations think that they can create you know, a, a separate analyst deck, which is, you know, le, you know, less excessive than the sales deck. And obviously that is really helpful. But uh, as Katie's just said, it's so important to, to, to personalize these things for the individuals. You know, if you can show an understanding of the, the specific challenges, the, the research agenda, the typical questions uh, that, 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 that a specific analyst is going to have on their mind, then that will be um, in incredibly helpful for, for the analyst. Just that feeling as an analyst of, of being shown only material that is really relevant to you and that uh, anticipates the questions that you are most likely to have on your mind, it's so rare that it's, it's a phenomenal feeling to be able to give to an analyst. Mm -hmm. David, there's, there's one question that I would love to throw at you because, uh, you know, it's so, it's so challenging. H how do you show the actual return on investment from, uh, from these uh, heightened engagements in the, in the current scenario? Is it justified to expect tangible leads and referrals from this kind of analyst engagement? That's such a great question. And I think a couple things um, come to mind. It's very hard to, to measure return on investment with simply engagements. Um, in my past, I've looked at the campaigns that we've done around the reports that we've commissioned or webinars. Um, but I think, um, with these heightened engagements, you can do a comparison, maybe quarter over quarter. Um, I know our engagements increased a lot and some of my former colleagues at Tableau have reported that their engagements have gone up um, in the hundreds of percent. Um, so I think, um, yeah, that's a really, that's a really tough question. Um, but I think if you compare quarter over quarter, year over year, and if you and if you start seeing more mentions um, or more featured reports or more people reaching out to you, you can look at it that way. Um, but yeah, it's very hard to measure return on investment with engagements. But maybe Duncan, you can have something to add um, to that as far as um, measuring ROI and, and engagements. 
Yeah, I, th I think one of the, what, my favorite line from uh, Kevin Lucas, uh, the analyst relations specialist at Forrester, is that a key task for analyst relations is to put responsibility for success with analysts back onto the business. And, uh, and, and that, that seems like a little bit of a cheeky, you know, uh, you know let's, uh, let's avoid responsibility. But actually, uh, the, the question of measurement, uh, specifically of, of, of the return, I think is really, is, is really crucial. If you think of an example like, uh, like Publicis Sapiens, yeah? So their sales force really understands analysts and they ask customers and also people who refuse to become customers uh, which analyst firms they're using. And this means that they're able to track in their CRM uh, the, the impact that analysts have. They're able to see which analysts are impacting the deals. And uh, for each firm, uh, you know, is this, are we more or less likely to, to win a deal with this firm being involved in, in advising the client than that firm involved in advising the client? And it means that they're able to say, yeah, but this year, you know, whatever, we had these 200 deals that were affected by analysts. Um, most companies don't have that kind of data. And whether or not they have that kind of data is very rarely anything to do with the analyst relations team, because often analyst relations teams are very distant from, uh, from, from the sales function. And very often a good salesperson never wants to ask a question uh, where where they know the answer isn't going to help the sale, so it, you re, so it requires a certain kind of of analyst settlement. An alternative approach that I've seen in trying to value these events is saying, well, how much time from analysts are we getting, and then uh, how much is that time worth? You know, imagine you've got twenty people who are coming along for two uh, uh, four hour sessions you know, that is whatever that is, 160 hours, how much would it cost for you to rent analysts for those 160 uh, hours? So this is, I don't know, like a kind of alternative equivalent uh, value. And it, it doesn't quite make sense because obviously there's a big difference between 20 people listening to one webinar and you having 21 hour conversations. Yeah. The, the value, the impact of, the, of those things is, is completely different. Um, what, what we find to be really important is to actually measure the perception of each interaction. And sometimes you can do that in one-to-one -one conversations by uh, asking, asking people, listening to the conversation, picking up on the tone of the conversation. Um, surveys after the event are, are really helpful. I mean, what, 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 one of the things that happen so, so rarely is that AR people ask analysts, how are we doing? Did that, did that session meet, meet your needs? There's no reason why we can't do it, but somehow we, we have a bit of a, uh, we're rather fearful uh, of, of asking analysts how, how we are doing. And then of course, the third thing is actually looking at what analysts write. You know, there, there are many strengths and weaknesses about, about looking on content, but if analysts are, but hopefully analysts are more likely to mention you after, after you have an event like that, and you can look at the, the impact of that, and you may even have been able to calculate a value of, a, of, a, of an additional analyst mention. You may see that these things correlate in a particular way. But all of these things are really about how your own organization is already doing that measurement, because the mm -hmm. AR team by itself probably doesn't have the resource uh, to, uh, to measure analyst relations in a very systematic way. You know, imagine most marketing functions would put 5, 10, 15% of their budget into measurement and evaluation. I don't know any, any analyst relations programs that are putting 2 or 3% of their budget into evaluation. And because they can't evaluate, they can't show their value, and because they can't show their value, it's very hard for them to defend and extend their budgets. I think also um, what, what strikes me if I'm sort of thinking about how we would approach this for, for our clients as well is it's really important to identify why it, it – it's really important to identify the, the, the way that you want analysts to help you, which would be, you know, is it around awareness building? Is it about reputation or is it specifically about sales? Because then what you can do is you can look at some factors which fall under those categories. So for awareness, it could be the briefings. For reputation, it could be the awards. 
And then for sales, it could be RFP creation or due diligence for vendor selection. So I think sort of really making sure that you're asking yourself the question at the beginning, which is what is it that I ultimately want to achieve? How can analysts help? is also a really important part of the measurement process. That's really, that is really, really useful. Um, I think that we have, oh, one more question just come in. Uh, I'm going to be super lazy, David, and try and put, put, put this question over to you because you're so good at asking questions on the fly. Will you take it if I throw it over to you? <laughs> yes. Um, look. Let me, Michael, let me read it. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I can, I mean, I can, I can, if you want to, I can, yeah, I mean, I, I can take a step and you can, and you can think about it. I mean, so the, Perfect. so the question actually, I realized I, I, I can't, I, I, I'm not sure if people in the audience can see the questions when they're, when they're submitted, maybe only the panelists can. But the, the question is, can you talk a little bit about the business to business relationship when the product is enterprise focused, but it's included in a larger solution and then the analyst doesn't focus on you since they only talk to vendors that sell directly to the enterprise and bundle your product under, uh, under their solution in a business to consumer way. So, so a, a scenario very similar to this is extremely common, which is every single vertical market. Yeah. So imagine if you're selling into, into healthcare or you're selling into construction or you're selling into manufacturing or you're selling into finance, that very often the analysts uh, are speaking to people uh, on the basis of their own vertical market expertise. And, uh, and this expertise may not be devoted to your, to your product. Indeed, they may not even really be aware of your product. You know, they, 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 may, uh, they may be speaking to customers who've got a pain point that your problem addresses, but they may not think of your solution as being a solution to the pain. So in, in, in those situations, um, one part of the problem is, is how big a part of the, of the, of the, of, of, of the solution are you able to uh, deliver? A second element is, are there channel partners who are, who are doing that bundling, who are taking your solution in with whom you can go and, and jointly brief and, and give context and locate uh, what you are saying? And then thirdly, how well are you able to address that pain point and start from the pain point that's felt in the enterprise and explain why your solution starts with that and, and ideally have case studies and references rather than starting from the technology? Because you can't educate an analyst completely on a whole new technology. You would almost always have to start off by talking about the pain point and then the customer and then only in a follow-up conversation drill into the specifics of the technology. That's the, that's the way that I would address that, that, uh, that question. Duncan, I, I, I couldn't put it better myself. One thing I want to add um, is ask yourself and your product marketing team what are some of the biggest differentiators that you bring. And when you talk to the analysts, I love the idea of bringing in some of the channel partners and addressing the pain points, but also um, jump to the top of the highest mountain and scream what the differentiator it is and what makes you the best piece in the puzzle, right? So, um, but yeah, that's the one thing I would add. Thank you. Good question. Okay, I think we have all the questions answered. That's fantastic, amazing. Um, before we close, I just wanna hand back Katie to you and, and, and then to David just to see if there, if there are any other uh, final final thoughts. And also, of course, if people have got other questions uh, that maybe they don't want to share on a webinar, uh, you know, how, how can people get in touch with you if they want to uh, develop the conversation a little bit? Absolutely. Um, well, firstly, we will follow up with all attendees and we'll, we'll send a link to the slides on so that people can access those. 
Um, but also please do connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, we're here for you. If we can chat at all um, to help, you know, to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation, we would love to do that. So yeah, it would be great to speak to some of you directly in the future. Thank you, Katie. And uh, I would love um, to connect with people over LinkedIn as well. Um, uh, my personal last name, of course, is in the information on the page. Um, and we're all in this together. Our world is turned upside down in many different ways. And let's continue to stay connected and empathize with each other and um, lock arms. And if we, if we need to walk through hell together, we'll do it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. So um, thank you so much for your questions and answers. These were really useful. The, the webinar wouldn't have been so so delightful uh, with, without them, but do get in touch if you have other, other questions and comments. Um, and thank you so much for your time. We'll be in touch about future webinars, uh, I'm sure. And uh, yeah, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. And thank you okay. also to, to Katie and David for your, for your time joining us for the webinar. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.